You're listening to the Book Talk Today podcast, a podcast that inspires readers to obtain valuable insights to inform, educate, and improve lives. My name is Orn Abdi. I'm an avid reader, best known for the creation of the One Minute Book Review community, and I'm sitting down with authors to delve deeper into the books they have written to uncover the story behind the story. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Book Talk Today podcast. Today we are welcoming back on the podcast Will Storr. Will is an award-winning writer and one of my personal favourites. He is the author of five acclaimed books including The Heretics, Selfie and The Science of Storytelling and today we'll be discussing his new book The Status Game on Social Position and How We Use It. Will, it's a pleasure to have you back on. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be back on. Thanks Anne. how are you doing? I'm, I'm very well, thank you. It's uh, like we were mentioning, like I mentioned before we started, it feels like yesterday that we were speaking about your book, The Science of Storytelling, and it's so nice to to have you back on to discuss your, your new book. And I think that the running theme throughout your last couple of books, I've read all of them now, bar the supernatural one, so I need to get round to the supernatural one, <laughs> but I've read all of them um, uh, from from there. And it seems to be status to be a running theme throughout the last the last couple and i think it's an it's an interesting topic and it seemed like the the right book to to be next given the the theme so just speak about your research around status and, and why you think that the, the topic is is really interesting in relation to human behavior yeah i think it's interesting because it's a it, it, it it's a fundamental kind of basic human driver um it, it, the, the way that we evolved as tribal animals is that we you know, in order to function in the tribe, we have to have these kind of two drives. One's connection. We always want to feel we want to be connected to other people. But once we're connected, we, we don't, we're not really happy to kind of flap about on the lower rungs of the group. You know, we like to kind of rise, you know, in, we like to rise and sort of earn the esteem of the people that we're in the group with. And, and, and you know, that's such a fundamental basic thing. Once you start seeing the world in terms of connection and status... You just see it everywhere. It's you know it's how humans do life. It's you know it's it's sport, it's industry, it's politics, it's social media. <laughs> you know it's such a huge thing. So yeah, I thought it was about you know yeah. it's definitely a ripe subject for a book. Where do you think the relationship is then between the storytelling aspects? I think at the beginning of the book you talk about the relationship between storytelling and status. Like where is the relationship between the two? Um, so the way I see it is that is that I mean as, as everybody knows that there are kind of two that there are two parts to our mind. There's the conscious and the the subconscious, and our conscious experience of of our lives in the world is a, is a kind of radically simplified and very biased um, kind of tweaked thing, and it takes the form of a story. So so so, so the, the you know the, the brain reorders reality in such a way that we we're at the centre of it. And everybody else is like supporting cast of characters and our lives are these plots, you know, these fantastically interesting to us journeys that we're on to make our life better or the world better. Or, you know, that's, so, so, so the conscious experience takes the um, takes the form of a story. And, you know, that's what I've been writing about for the last couple of books, at least. But then that sort of begs the question, OK, if that's if that's the, the, the illusion, what's the reality? What's actually the truth of uh, 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 of of what we're up to, and and as I said, you know, I think the truth is it's connection and status. We tell all these very flattering stories about why we do what we do, but it's very hard to kind of um, avoid the uh, reality that most a lot of what we do um, has status benefits attached to it uh, that, that we often like to deny and think, oh well, the, the real reason is because I'm just wonderful. But of course, even that I'm wonderful. <laughs> Is a, yeah. is a status Com claim. <laughs> you can't, I mean, you, you, you can't, it's so embedded in human life, you, you can't kind of separate anything out from it. You know, it, it, even the, you know, the, the most people that we, we consider most selfless and wonderful and holy, they're famous, you know, and that's how we treat them, we raise them in status. You know, Mother Teresa and, uh, and uh, you know, Gandhi and... Um, uh, the Dalai Lama are superstars, you know, they're moral Dalai celebrities. Lama. Yeah, mm. yeah. 
I know you talked about that as well in, in the book, and I, that was something that I thought as well, which was very interesting because obviously I come from a religious background. So when I think of status, I think of obviously religious speakers, and you referenced some in the book as well. You talked about them, and I always thought that that is somewhat of a dichotomy sometimes when in, in religion, specific, specifically, you almost think as the the humble speaker, the humble person in front of God, yet individuals see themselves as somewhat. Um, I I almost think of like the Christian far right in the deep south when they have these preachers and they stand up on stage and they do all this stuff they they are portraying that image of status it, it's not just about you know that humble religious person they they want to get to the top of of their of their group or, or their clan yeah it, and it's it, you know and it's a deeply kind of subconscious thing as well you, you know but it's, as you say it's so embedded in in it's so embedded in the way humans experience life that 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 you that, you know it just happens almost automatically. Well, not even almost. It happens automatically. So, the, a religious person will s- s- claim to be humble and um, will begin saying things that other people find useful and interesting, and gather around them and start raising them in status and deferring to them and offering them gifts. And you know, it, 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 especially I, you know, I come from a Christian background, and and and, and you see the you know the catholic background and you, you see the status rewards that that have historically been offered and even say popes and bishops and you know that they, they, they i think is it is it bishops or cardinals are called your grace your, your grace you know it's it's so uh it it the, the status there is so um it's not even hiding itself when you're when they're wearing their big golden hats and you know insisting on being referred to as your grace you know it's yeah, um, the guards it, it, yeah, it's just what we do. It, it, yeah. You know, it, it, it's easy to laugh at it, but but it is just what people do. It, it, it's how humans organise existence. So, 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 so yeah, the status game, these games we play for status, are it, it defines human life. So can you just talk about then the origins of some of the status games that we play? I know in, in the book you talk about like two prestige games, so virtue and success, and then how they're, they're related to these games that we play with one another and how that transferred from tribal elements of, of games and, and how they were ranked in hierarchies, specifically in tribes, and how that moved to like more urban games where it came more about whether it be, like we've saying, religion or, you know, wealth. You know, there's different games that we can play, but in relation to the two prestige games of, of virtue and success specifically. Yeah, so, so 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 you've got to sort of understand, you know, what, where it all comes from. And as I said before, it comes from the fact that humans are apes who have worked out the secrets of um, working together of cooperation. So, so, so some people, you know, Jonathan Haidt, who I know you're very familiar with. In the, in the happiness hypothesis, he says that humans are part ape, part B, you know, which is a really good way of thinking about it. We're so we're so social, we're hyper social apes. And, and um, so, so, you've, so you've got to look at the mechanisms of how that sociality kind of works. You know, we have language, unlike other apes. So, it's, so we can, um, you know, we're really good at cooperation, but the cooperation happens in groups, in the form of groups. So um, we are driven to, um, uh, you know, back in the day when we were evolving and this circuitry was about evolving, we, you know, we were driven to seek this connection and, and, and um, status. And the connection is about feeling accepted by the group, feeling, you know, the, the, the people, the, the, they, co- they want to cooperate with you and you're a cooperative person. Um, but the status is about, you know, how useful you are. So, 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 you know, nature worked out, sort of evolution worked out for us this system whereby we, we'd be rewarded if we showed ourselves to be useful to the group. And there are two ways of being useful to the group, to the tribe. And the, and the first way is by being virtuous, by being moral. So that can take the form of being generous with the stuff that you've picked or, you know, the, the, the prey that you've killed. It can be um, that you're very good at enforcing the rules or even following the rules of the tribe, um, you know, taking part in the rituals. Um, it can be that you're courageous in fights and in, you know, in, in battle. It can be, you know, so, so, so being virtuous is one whole set of ways that we, that we could earn status. So it defines all these games that we can play. And the other set of games is about competence. It's about being useful, you know, being a really talented hunter, a really talented sorcerer or a honey finder or, a, you know, all these myriad ways that you can actually be useful by being skillful at something. So, that's, that, so that kind of d- defines two ways in the tribe that you could become prestigious, virtue and success. 
and you know and, and it, it, there's no different today if you look at the superstars of today they're either there because they're virtuous they're you know um, either you know religious superstars or political superstars or you know in, in a way royal, you know, royal groups royal families play a virtue game because it's all about deference and conformity and all that they don't, they're not good at anything the royal family are they they're, they're, it's just all about deference and uh, and conformity and ritual or, or you can be successful and, and I you know and in the book I argue that that's what defines the modern era is that is that we worked out is it is that for kind of generations and generations we were just playing mostly virtue games it was mostly to do with deference to religion or royalty or you know local groups and then you know post-industrial revolution the success games took over first in the west and increasingly around the world and we started awarding status much more for competence and you know that, that, that that's a really fantastic thing and, and, and so I, and I think that the, the, the main thing that I think about the you know the the virtue games is that it's easy to be cynical and 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 it sounds like what I'm saying is oh well um, people are so stupid um, they say that they're being good but it all it is it, they're just trying to boost themselves uh, but but I think that's the wrong way of looking at it and, and that comes from a place that we, we we're used to being suspicious of status you know really you know I came to sort of think that actually it's amazing that 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 that, that we evolved a system for rewarding other people for being virtuous. Because that makes us virtuous, you know. So, 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 so that makes us altruistic and generous and empathetic, and, and you know. And so, so all of the good things that, are, that, that 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 we think about, you know, uh, we think about when we think about humans at their best, it, it's there. It's kind of powered by the status game, and that's as I said. I think, I think that's an incredible thing that, that we've evolved this system that we that, that we're rewarded for being good like that. It's like Santa. Santa, you know, it's like a Santa Claus kind of thing where if you're good, you get you get you get prizes and, and you do, you know, you do. You know, people love you when you're selfless and courageous. I think in relation to success, I think it makes sense because competence, uh, maybe it's obviously a, a, a certain way of thinking. It's a recent way of thinking in terms of competence being the, the way that you define status. But I think virtue or, or uh, seeing virtue as a way of, of of giving status is interesting because when you give virtue to someone, you're automatically putting yourself lower on the status pole. You're basically putting someone else higher and you're saying, look, I applaud you for being this because you're this virtue. But then it sort of puts you down the level at the same time. Or do you feel like it rises you up because you're attaching yourself to that person? Where do you think that relationship is? Um, I, I don't. Yeah, I don't think so. So that's one of the interesting kind of nuances um, uh, about this. It, it, and it's certainly true that when you know somebody else is conspicuously celebrated, that, that, that relatively speaking, we might move down a little bit. But 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 I think you know the, the kind of healthiest status games are the ones that are small, and um, a, a, and the status is kind of more freely awarded. You know, if everybody is kind of awarding status relatively freely to everybody else. That's a really healthy group. Um, not all groups are like that. You know, when, when they come very, when, when the hierarchy becomes very steep, you know, in the book I talk about um, organizations like Enron, uh, in which, so Enron had a, 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 well, one of these companies that had what they called a rank and yank, rank and yank system, where every, every employee was ranked in the top, I don't know, like 15% were amazing, but the top, the bottom were at risk of being fired. So, so, so that creates this, this environment uh, in which everybody is just um, in a fucking panic and just like, you know, um, <laughs> uh, uh, um, terrified of, of being in that bottom 15%. But it doesn't have to be like that, you know. It, it, and as I say, I think you could have a very, and you, do, you can have very healthy, optimistic, positive groups where people freely award status to one another without feeling that they're um, doing themselves down. I don't, I don't think that's, um, that's necessarily true. I think, it, it, you know, it, I, I think in unhealthy groups, that's true. But, but in healthy groups, it, it, it isn't necessarily true. You, mean the, you think it's more of, a, more of a relationship between status. It's more of a conformity thing in the sense of cooperation. So cooperation and status go hand in hand. You can't have an active um, cooperative tribe and... and uh, and not have status being freely awarded? No. Uh, well, I mean, you can, it can be because there, there, there's a third way of, um, of earning status, as you'll know from the book. And, and, and the third way is, is, is unpleasant, and that's dominance. So, 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 so you know, it, um, dominance is, uh, is forcing status from people. So the thing about the two prestige ga games of virtue and success is, is people offer you that, that status. You know, you, you show yourself to be useful, 
And people go, oh, you're great. I oh, loved that you did that. And they think more of you and you go, oh, and that feels really good. And that's how that works. But dominance is, 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 is the much more animalistic um, way. It's either physical force or the threat of force, the threat of um, uh, you know, reputation destruction or, the, or physical um, threat. And I think in, uh, you know, in, in, in kind of tighter games like Enron, you know, these companies um, like that or, or, or um, more radical uh, religions or cults, um, there, there's always that threat of force. There's, a, there's that dominance going on as well, where, where if you don't conform, um, you, you'll be punished. So, 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 that, so that's when that's when things get really unpleasant. And of course, you know, I talk about that a lot in the book as well about how dominance um, uh, is this kind of part of human nature that is the you know that is unimaginably ancient. You know, it's it's, it's millions of years older than the prestige games, and and it's an, an ineradicable part of us as well. Yeah, the interesting thing is you reference a lot of different examples of that. In, in the book, whether it was Russia, Germany, um, you you also reference different sort of genocides. And I thought it was very interesting reading it because this idea of, in the book, you say toxic morality. So in reference to genocide being like highly moralistic, because when you think of genocide, you don't think of those people being moral. You just think of those people being evil and they do their deeds because they are sort of satanic in their thoughts. But once you sort of dig down a bit, you start to understand that they believe what they're doing is right for themselves and the way they perceive the world. So it's very interesting because those dominance virtue games are carried out with justice and fairness. But obviously from an outlook, uh, an outlooker, they think, how? How is that? How is that fairness or how is that virtue in, 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 in their actions? <laughs> yeah, well, wait, wait, yeah, so, so, so every, each status game has its own internal set of rules. Uh, that, that, that you know, and part of connection is when you connect into a status game, whether it's a, a corporation or a religion or whatever it is, um, you, you kind of accept its rules of play, its ideas of what's true, um, uh, uh, and you know those rules and uh, those rules and beliefs about uh, they'll generally be that your your group your game is better than your rivals, uh, you deserve the status that you've got, and your rivals don't. Um, and, 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 you know, and belief, uh, belief is a kind of prerequisite for connection. And that's why people can become so irrational. You know, I talk in the book about, you know, anti-vax beliefs and about how, you know, belief, belief in that, that vaccines are harmful um, is, a, is a kind of prerequisite for kind of connection into those games. Um, so, and so, you know, and I think that's that that's where humans are at their most irrational It's because, you know, there are certain classes of belief that, that, that nobody really argues about, like the length of the Mississippi River or whatever, or, the, or what boiling point is. And uh, but then there are other classes of belief that people argue endlessly about. And those classes of belief are the ones that people plug their sense of status into. You know, they, 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 it's their identity as, as a person is. Yeah, it is connected to that belief, and, and and so those those are the beliefs that we kind of fight over, and I and I think what people don't realise when you're, you're you're looking at these groups is that is that is that they sincerely believe um, them. You know, that's you talk about the, the ghost book that I wrote when I was in my twenties, and that was one of my big takeaways from hanging out with people who believe in ghosts is that they're not um, making it up. Like you know, they they really believe it, and 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 a few of them don't. A few of them are like. Um, quite cynical and they're doing it to make money you know they're saying I'm a, I'm a you know I'm a medium and I'm in touch with the dead these people are so obvious it's so obvious to spot the, the, the cynical ones because they you know they're, they're completely inconsistent and um, but but most people actually believe it and, and that's the thing about these anti-vaxxers they, they really really believe it and, and and I think that's one of the sort of big weak spots in human cognition is that it's it's much more important to our kind of subconscious minds that we uh, accept the beliefs of our groups than it is that we actually understand what truth is. It doesn't really give a shit about what's true. What matters is that we, that, that we earn connection and status. And if that means believing that um, vaccines are full of poison, then that's what you're going to believe. And, and, and you know, and that's why we see so many. Yes, and, and so you know, and, and that expands out to things like you know, to, 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 to the most kind of extreme degrees in genocide. You know, people who commit genocides genuinely believe that their group is correct and right. And the group that they're kind of punishing um, has unfairly um, challenged them and they need putting in their place. And it's this kind of awful kind of moral theatre that, 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 they, that, they, that they engage in. 
So the Nazis, you know, believed that they were morally correct in doing what they were doing. They told a story in which the Jews were responsible for everything that was wrong with that happened to them, and and, and that they were they, they they could only progress into the future if that problem was finally solved. Yeah, it was also the idea that every single time something didn't go according to plan, they sort of reworked the story to fit what they were looking for, which I thought was very interesting is things happened like one of the one of the best stories and one of the funniest stories in the book I found was the way you talked about the human individual metamorphosis. I was reading that and I was laughing about the whole thing because I thought it was oh, such oh, a good. great example. Uh, um, and the interesting thing that, that, that came from that story, I think it would be good to talk about that a bit, but it was the interesting thing how low status players invent fictitious games to make them appear to be high status. So perhaps you can talk about that in relation to the human individual metamorphosis because I thought that was a great example and a great story. We need connection and status, like we need food and water. They're, 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 you know, for our psychology, they are absolute essentials, and we'll, we'll, we, we, we will look to find them anywhere. And so, you know, when, when people are scratching their heads, wondering why, um, you know, young men in low socioeconomic groups join radical religions or street gangs, that's the answer because they want status and they're going to going to go to the place where it's on offer and believe what, what they want, what they're supposed to believe, and act how they want to act. And it's also the true of cults. And what's really interesting about cults is that the kinds of people that are attracted to cults are the kinds of people who have been rejected by the conventional games of everyday life. They can't get along in work. They can't get along in conventional religions. They're just alienated, alienated and alienated. And they get to this stage of kind of desperation of thinking, well, I, I, you know, I just want that you just want connection and status. And what, one of the things that cults does is it offers an extremely precise um, way of doing it. Cults say basically... I'm going to tell you exactly what to do and exactly who you need to be. And if you follow these rules precisely, you will, and you know, gain incredible status. And you know, and that's what cults do. They offer unbelievable, like stupid rewards. Like, uh, and so, so, so in 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 the case of human individual metamorphosis, which is seven, the seventies cult that I write about, it was literally that you're going to you're going to graduate to the level above human. So you're going to become superhuman, literally. And the UFOs are going to come down and we're going to lead you on these UFOs. And we're going to leave the earth. And that's what's going to happen. So, so, so and they believed, they believed this. Um, and, um, and so, you know, the, you join the cult and, and, and you know, the, the, the level of um, precision was insane. You know, like to the, 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 they would specify things like how much toothpaste you're allowed to put on your toothpaste, uh, your toothbrush. Um, your vitamins had to be taken at 7.22 every day. Um, it, it, scrambled eggs had to be cooked until they were completely dry but not burnt. Like everything. They had these huge rules book, rule books which would define you know, the most precise um, uh, codes of behaviour. You know, any individual... So, so what, what one, of the, one of the most kind of striking qualities of, of cults is, is that they insist they're the only status game you're allowed to play. So that's why they ask you to cut yourself off from family, friends. They don't like you to get outside employment because the, uh, your only source of status and connection can be the cult, and that's it. Um, uh, yeah, uh, you know things like um, f freedom of thought is banned. You know you're not allowed to gossip, daydream. Um, uh, th th there was this kind of practice they did of, ho of holding up a they called it a blank card to thought. So, 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 so if one of the cult leaders said something you, that you didn't think was true before you even had the thought that's not true, you'd you'd stop the thought, you'd halt it, <laughs> so, so so that you always believe what you were told to believe, and and, and you got used to doing this. And, and this 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 poor bastard who um I, who wrote this memoir that <laughs> that, that I kind of use as my main source for the um for the book, he, you know, one of the things that was banned was um sexual thought you weren't allowed to have any sexual thought or practice you weren't allowed to obviously masturbate into the extent that you had to sleep with your hands above your waist at night in case you kind of did a i don't know a sleep wank or something i don't know what yeah and so so, so he you know so he, but he really struggled with this uh, and to the extent that, that that when it when the cult leader said look um somebody one of the members of the cult used to be a, a, a doctor's assistant and, and, and the doctor used to do um testicle removal and she's just like, well, I reckon I can do that because I saw it, <laughs> I saw it happen. And so they were like, okay, well, why don't we just um, have everyone, like all the men, they can have their, they can have their nuts taken out. <laughs> so, so that's what they did. And this guy was like, yeah, oh, brilliant, you know, because if I have my nuts taken out, I won't have any sexual thoughts anymore. So um, uh, they, they were going to do one to, as a tester, 
and they kind of flipped a coin and he lost the coin toss. He's very annoyed. Um, and his kind of rival had his balls, take, balls taken out. Um, but it didn't work. And um, his nutsack swel swel swelled to the size of a, of, of a, of a, of a basketball. And they had, they had to be taken to hospital. And one of the things they did was so they didn't get in trouble. <laughs> in the room where they did the operation, they put a sign on the room saying Mexico. So they could, they could, honestly, they could say without lying to the... the, the, to the the people in the hospital, what ha where did this happen? And they could say Mexico. You went to Mexico to get it done. And anyway, so the guy was healed and 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 he was all sorted out. And the, and the, and the the guy um, who, who was became very jealous and he wished he'd um, had his his nuts re removed. Um, but anyway, he ended up just giving up. And he, the, he, the, the, the sexual kind of urge was so strong in him that he couldn't resist. And he, and he ended up just saying, look, I, you know, he, he would say that he, he was so bottled up that he, that, that, that he would just have spontaneous orgasms. So he ended up leaving the cult and was very upset when he found out that they, that they found a way of um, doing, actually going to real Mexico and having this operation. And lots of, lots of the cult members had their testicles removed. Uh, and then they ended up um, voluntarily killing themselves, you know, because they thought that they were going to go to heaven to do this. And anyway, I mean, the point of the all this is, 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 that, is that, you know, we, we get it wrong when we think about cults traditionally, like we get it wrong when we think about um, religion and genocide. We think, well, um, you know, we think in terms of the story uh, and the story is always about heroes and villains and people who commit genocide. They're just like they're, they're monsters and people who, who, um, who, who join cults are brainwashed. And they're not monsters and they're not brainwashed. They're, they're just people doing what brains are designed to do. And that's seeking connection and status. And, you know, the really interesting thing about human, you know, metam individual metamorphosis, like all cults, is that, is, that, is that they weren't forced or coerced to do anything. Um, they, were, they were all there voluntarily. And, and the way he described yeah. it was like, it's like you saying you want to be an astronaut, but I'm not going to follow the rules of NASA. It's like, it's crazy. We wanted to be in the cult. We wanted to ascend to the level above human so we, did, we wanted to do everything that was told of us and um, so, 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 so uh, you know and, and I think cults are really interesting because if you're thinking about it in terms of the status game they're the purest status games there are you know and, and mm. you know what happens when you think about human groups in terms of religions corporations sports teams they're just cults but they're looser and looser and looser and, and less and less conformist um, and you know and, and as you get the further you get away from the cult the healthier that status game becomes Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And, 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 and that's part of how the, the cult has their power because, you know, it, it, you know, status is this fundamental human need. And, and if the only place you're getting your status is from the cult, then, then the threat of expulsion is, is a genuine catastrophic um, threat. You know, what, what, what some of the examples that I talk about this is during the Soviet Union, um, and you, these poor people who completely signed on to the communist, you know, status game, um, and who were then denounced for having done nothing. They were they were just absolutely baffled by this because because you, you, they completely bought the idea that the Communist Party were, were always right, and it was logically impossible for them to make a mistake. Uh, but all, uh, and they were completely loyal. But also the Communist Party was saying that they were, had been disloyal somehow. So they were just sort of in this mad state of, I must have done something, but I don't know what I've done. Uh, so, so, and so anyway, a lot of them end up confessing that they've done these terrible, you know, anti, anti party, anti communist kind of acts, um, you know, uh, betraying the revolution for various reasons. And, you know, it's a t terrible situation. But it was almost easy for the people who really didn't like the Communist Party and hadn't bought into that that game who, who who did have a bit of a guilty conscience but you know the ones who, who didn't were, were just absolutely baffled um so so yeah you know again it's it's um you know people really believe this stuff you know it, it's and it's hard to imagine when you're looking outside in you know there's a sort of a, i think a communist you know com communist a, 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 a common idea that that, that you know Nobody was really communist. It was they were, it was all just sort of forced upon them. But millions of people completely believed, um, you know, in, in the ideals of communism. It, 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 growing up, I was always fascinated by the experience of East of Germany, of East Germany, who, 
you know, in the, for the for, for decades in the first half of the 20th century were, were Nazis and then they flipped and became communists. And, and, you know, like these are the same people. You know, the people lived through both of those things. And lots of those people, like a huge number of those people, believed in both of those ideas. They just flipped. And, and, and you know, how, how can that be? Well, the reason, the answer is because brains are programmed to seek connection and status. And if you're, if the rewards are there, people will generally, generally pretty good at, at, at you know, joining those games. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in the book, you gave a great example talking about uh, the Ger- the Germans in relation to the status game and the rewards. Because I wasn't aware of how much rewards that they got actually to be part of the party. And you get it, you just get so much. It was like benefits, like when you get to when you apply for a job and you have a look at what the benefits have. Like you get a car, you get health insurance, you get access <laughs> to a gym membership. It's like there's like a huge list of things you get if you join the, the the Communist Party in Germany. I feel like the same thing when you're looking at a job, and you can see, you know, they had hyperinflation they had you know people were starving so obviously of course they would join the party because it's just it was the sensible thing to do obviously if you have a family that you have to look after as well and you've got immediate needs of course you'd join that's right and, and you know and it's the same i mean it's, it's the same with the communists you know but you know the communists weren't particularly popular when they rose to power the nazis famously had less than 50 percent of the vote but both both of those groups um, earned, you know, uh, g- general acceptance, and and they did it because, you know, they 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 offered status to people who, who bought onto it, and, and they they gave it too, you know, it, it worked. Um, um, the, the Nazis were, were especially surprising to me when I when I did the research on that because, uh, again, you know, when we were growing up, especially in the UK, we we sold the story of the Nazis, and that's that Hitler was this monster. And, you know, he somehow kind of hypnotized the Germans with his power of his oratory into believing monstrous things. And, um, uh, you know, and this is it's obviously not true that Hitler was a monster because, mo- you know, monsters is his fantasy. <laughs> it's not actually real. And, you know, someone's speeches, oratory, can't, you know, you can't flip somebody from being normal into a Nazi with a speech. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that, you know. Um, so, 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 uh, but, 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 what, but, but what the story rejects and what, what the story seldom admits is that, is that the Nazi party it, it offered major status. And they supplied it too, you know, they, they really did, you, you know, under, you know, during the kind of uh, Hitler's leadership, the economy completely turned around. Um, but they, there was huge benefits to, 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 to joining the Nazi party. They, they were even putting on things like cruises, holidays, operas, uh, you know, giving away theatre tickets. Uh, there was these huge winter aid drives looking after the... Um, uh, you know the 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 needy. They had there was a sort of enormous, um, you know, far sighted health and safety um, um, uh, programs. They, the Nazis were the first people to um, uh, um, uh, definitively find the link between lung cancer and smoking, and they were the, like a big anti smoking. Um, programs they, they they innovated with things like the motorway system um, you know thirty five thousand people employed on that so so, so you know they, they didn't just walk the walk like donald trump they actually they actually did what they said they said they were going to do they turned around yeah. they turned Germany around and um, mm. at the time it was the treaty of Versailles that was there was this huge source of national humiliation for, for for Germany and he just smashed it to pieces he just defied it um, with uh, with with no apparent consequence from the West and then that's why people went crazy for him is because people want status and when the, the Nazis came to power Germany had been completely humiliated they were the most successful companies in, country in continental Europe, perhaps all of Europe, easily, and um, before the First World War, they'd be completely humiliated again and again and again. Um, and he turned it around in, in a matter of years, and that's why people went nuts for him, because he, you know, he he he, he, um, he and his party gave them status on, on, on a massive level. So, and that, and so that to me is a far more um, uh, uh, believable explanation than that he was just this like monster that came along and hypnotized people with his magic eyes you know that's the story that we're brought up with and it's kind of it's kind of nuts yeah it is kind of nuts i'm exaggerating a bit it's not really you know it's not the whole yeah, story obviously. but but there's but but it's but, you know but that is it you know that pe- people scratch their heads over how did it happen and, and and you know the rise of the nazis how could it happen make sense of it but when you understand the need for status it, it it's perfectly explicable it's also interesting in the fact that there's a lot of people talking about how hitler was actually quite organized in the sense that to create a system like the nazi system you have to be incredibly organized and he's not just an evil person doing evil things he had this 
this specific system in a specific vision of an Aryan race and he put it into action there was a system there so there's there's some sect of people that believe that he's actually was quite an organized individual I, I I'm clearly saying that obviously I, I'm not a supporter of his but it's just interesting to view it from from history to sense that <laughs> he wasn't just evil for the sake of being evil there was something there um, that was a bit deeper in the sense of like you said status and and creating a race of individuals that had status yeah absolutely and this idea of evil for the sake of being evil that's the cartoon that's that, that that's the story and there are people like that called psychopaths you know who but the, the, you know hitler wasn't a psychopath um he, he he was a he was a politician who his brain told this story about the world um uh, 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 that, that was that was kind of fantasy about the, the source of uh you know germany's humiliation their lack of status um and and it was a story that he that that that, that um lots of Germans believed, and it's a story that he kind of sold to, to lots of Germans who didn't previously b believe it. Um, but we, you know, we, we we all do this to a certain extent. You know, I, I do this. I'm sure you do this. It's it's human nature. When we feel that our status, our sense of status, has been unfairly um, diminished by another group, and we weave these very toxic stories um, about that group. You know, very easily. You, you know, um, that, and that's, that's you've only got to look at Twitter and. See, that's what Twitter is. It's full of people telling stories um, that, 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 that turns the, the person challenging their sense of status into a monster, into an evil demon, into a Hitler kind of character. And, and all that's really going on are these rival groups, mm -hmm. you know, competing for status. And, 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 and you know, and the, the story is, is what causes the damage. I mean, we, we, one, of the, one of the sort of the big kind of light bulb moments for me in the book was, was when I was doing the research on, on the incel culture yeah. and um, Elliot Rogers, the spree killer, um, who, who's, whose story I go into in some depth in, in an early chapter, yeah. because you know, it happened to him and it, ha and it happens to a lot of these um, spree killers. You know, the, the, the guy in Plymouth yeah. recently, he seemed from looking at his YouTube videos, it's, he was a, you know, it's full of status. You people are up here and I'm down here. It's not fair. Um, you know, so whenever you see up and down, that's the status game. And and Elliot Rogers was a classic case in point, and he was unusual because he left behind this hundred and eight thousand word autobiography, which was this really gruesome, um, but you know, in a, in a quite gripping um, memoir of his descent into depravity. He was, you know, at the one sort of point, very narcissistic individual, but but also brutally honest about himself. Um, you know, spared no shame, and and um, but you see the madness that he fell into. He, it, it, he, 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 was a, he was a person who was, who was certainly narcissistic. He thought he was wonderful and beautiful and gorgeous and sophisticated and all this stuff. And, but, he, but, but he was r routinely and regularly rejected by everyone, including young women. And in, um, when he became adolescent, and uh, uh, he, uh, he, this became a source of extreme distress to him. And it became uh, uh, kind of obsessed with this. Uh, you know, there's evidence that he was autistic. And I think this might have been his potentially been some unfortunate he became very obsessed about about why women don't find me attractive when i'm so beautiful um and but his brain told this like extraordinarily terrible story about um uh, that, that, that kind of turned his lack of status into the opposite in which he was actually a chosen individual and the story was essentially that women are, the, are responsible for everything wrong in the world because they they always choose the stupid thick aggressive jock mm. types to mate with and so they have um, aggressive jock children and aggressive jocks rule the world and sophisticated gorgeous men like me you know are left on the shelf um and so, so 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 that's what he decided and that that was his rationalization for his hatred towards women and you know jock type men and then and then he he decided that that um this you know his this big insight was a sign of his greatness and, and actually the the future that he wanted that he that he thought was he wanted to happen was it was in which he was in charge and that sex would be completely abolished and women most women would just be killed they'd be just you know wiped out and there would be a few women left that would be artificially inseminated in like laboratories and that's how the human race would keep going um and you know, you listen to that, and you think, well, this guy's obviously very mentally ill. That is about <laughs> that's the, that is about as misogynist yeah. as it's possible to get. 
and it and it's just the most grotesque, insane, extreme thing to think. But then you look at the Nazis and you think, but that is exactly what the Nazis ended up thinking about the Jews, and they did it. That they started wiping them out. So, so how crazy is Elliot Roger? Uh, and, and 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 how and you know, in in the sense that he was an outlier. Uh, uh, but why well, I don't think I don't think he, I mean I think he was an outlier in the sense that he was he, 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 he was very narcissistic yeah. and you know possibly had this kind of slightly autistic obsession with um, pretty girls uh, and that 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 makes him an outlier. But in terms of the the fact that his brain was telling a convenient story which justified his lack of status and um, um, kind of turned toxic uh, and turned into monsters, his aggressors. I, I think that's human. That's human nature. At it. It's human nature at its very worst. But but it's human nature. You, you see it everywhere all the time. Just not to that extreme. The interesting thing uh, in regards to what happened in Portsmouth the other week, actually, that was one of the things I wanted to mention. So thank mm. you for bringing that up. Was you mentioned this quote in in the book, and I thought it was a it was a I think it's an African proverb. Mm. I'm trying to remember, it's I've, I've noted it down somewhere, and I want to get it right. Um, the child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. And I thought it was a very chilling African proverb yes. because I thought it was uh, in relation to what happens with, with, with incels. I thought it's the case. It's yours. You have told yourself this story. You have this lack of status. You've convinced yourself of this story that the world or the village is is against you and there's no way that you can be part of the village and be part of the society at large and you've told yourself this story you confine yourself to your basement into your home and you don't go out into the world and you make up these grandeurs of how you're better than everyone else because you don't put yourself in those situations and then the only thing left is just to see the world burn because that's the only way to have your perceived higher status and i think it's a because I was trying to explain this to my mum because my mum and my brother had never heard of incels before mm. that what happened in, in Portsmouth and I had to try and explain to them what an incel was. The first thing was like, how do you know these things? And I'm like, I read a lot. <laughs> <laughs> this, 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 is what I, this is what I do. I, I read about incels in my spare time because I'm just cool like that. <laughs> but it's just, it's interesting because it's not, it's not as, it's not as simple as just saying that he was evil in the sense of he just wanted to go and go on a shooting spree. There is something a lot deeper and darker going on with those individuals in relation to status. Yeah, that's right. I, I, you know, I, and in the book, I, I basically write that the most dangerous people are kind of grandiose, narcissistic people who have their status removed. Because if you're grandiose, if you're, you know, if you're on that narcissistic kind of spectrum, you feel completely entitled to a certain level of status, a high level of status, and you won't be able to cope with somebody disrespecting you or taking it down. So, so you're going you're gonna to respond, you know, very badly. And if you're male, it's even more dangerous because it, 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 it massively heightens the chances that you're going to respond um, with, with physical violence. But you know, w women don't get off the hook either. You know, w you know, they, they, f females use um, dominance too, but it's much more likely to be reputation destruction. Um, you, you know, p d removing your prestige, um, re removing you know, uh, and your so any of your sources of prestige. And we, of course, we see that 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 kind of defines um, this kind of dominance practice on social media. It's not physical violence on social media; it's reputational violence and men and women are equally you know, likely to engage in that kind of destruction. And do you feel like it's becoming specifically more pernicious in the fact that you can never leave that group, especially online? Like you're always tapped into that group, into that Reddit, into that subreddit, into that Twitter feed. Do you feel like it becomes even more pernicious because you can basically <laughs> never leave it day in, day out? Well, I think it becomes addictive because... Um, it, it, I think it becomes pernicious when those groups become a significant source of status for you. One of the stories I tell in the book is this young woman, Miranda Dinder, who yeah. was 18 years old, um, pregnant, all her friends were at college, so it's quite isolated. Um, and she had the misfortune to hire a midwife who encouraged her not to vaccinate her kid. And she was like, what? That's mad. Um, what's all that about? And she sort of was researching it and you know, joined this Facebook group and found that very quickly that, you know, she, 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 she was vulnerable to that group because she was 18 years old and, and she was raised in a family of women and she loved, you know, she was attracted to strong, powerful women um, in general. And, and this is what she found in this group. And she, so, so, so she immediately wanted to be like them. 
um, uh, you know, and, and, and she was encouraged and rewarded for, um, uh, you know, adopting their beliefs. And then once she'd adopted their beliefs, going out into the world to evangelize to, to friends and family and a doctor about how awful vaccines were. And, you know, so, so, and, and, and I think, for, you know, for, for lots of people, um, it's, you know, for people like Miranda, that can easily become your main source of status. I mean, if you don't feel like a particularly statusful person in your everyday life, um, then it's very easy for social media to provide a source of status for you that's... You know, look at the QAnon people. I mean, you know, on the day that they were invading the White House... Mm. They all felt like they were like Tom Cruise at the, you know, the climax of a action adventure movie. You know, they, they would have felt massively stateful. We're saving the world. You know, we're, we're here. You know, we're taking the fight to the baddies. So they, they would have all felt massively statusful. And, and you know, and, and so that's the drug. You know, that's the drug. And that's why it's hard to let go, not only of the groups, but, but of their beliefs. Because letting go of the belief is letting go of our sense of status, which is incredibly important to us. Is that why change is so difficult in relation to those groups or leaving a group like that? Because your identity is so intertwined. Yeah, with it. That, that, I think that is right. Yeah, yeah, that is right. And, and, I, and I think the answer is, you know, the, the, I think the best way of tackling those kinds of issues is, is giving people a way out that um, also includes... Uh, um, you know, a kind of alternative form of status. So, so, so for, for, for Miranda Dinder, what, what got her out of that was that she also had this idea, this other identity as somebody that loved science and she was a big science nerd and she said she used to read, you know, science textbooks for fun when she was a kid. And so, so, so that was another sort, that was another kind of identity, kind of status identity that she had. You know, she was in the game of science nerds and she started noticing in these forums that, that, that some of these people were saying stuff that was so obviously not true, like um, people are only gay because of vaccines. And, you know, that, that was what she's like, that's not obviously not true. And, and so, so, so she had this, you know, she, uh, you know uh, and when she started to suspect that, this, that it was anti-scientific or, or it was dressed up as pro it was scientific, the anti-vaccine thing. But, but, but these other claims started to kind of, yeah. you know, destroy that for her. And, and I think if she had, didn't have this rival identity, she, 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 would, she would have stayed stuck in, in, that, in that group. But, but it began conflicting with this, you know, with this other identity she had. So, so, so the, I think that's why, you know, like, like um, d diminishing people who belong to these groups is, is always a mistake. You know, calling them stupid um, is just going to make them dig mm. in and defend themselves yeah I, you quote in the book actually people who appear a bit brainwashed have invested too much of their identity into a single game so i think l what you just said is in relation to that quote is the fact that you need to play multiple games because if one game seems to be no not logical it doesn't fit you anymore you haven't invested your whole identity into it similar to what we were saying earlier about the the cult group you know they didn't fit into their there it didn't make sense anymore to them in the sense that one of the the members died so the whole idea of the ufo and being trans transformed into a higher being didn't work so they just killed themselves because that's the that was the only way for them to continue to play the game instead of going into another one yeah but yeah that's right and there, there, there's lots of um but i i think more you know more common is that there, 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 there are ways that people um manage to update their beliefs in such a way that the general belief is is protected so, so so what you'll find in lots of doomsday cults um is that um um you know people will say oh um we know for a fact that the earth is going to end on this day and then the, the world doesn't end <laughs> so so what do they do they, they they don't update their beliefs in the sense that they're wrong they update their beliefs in the sense they say oh we've saved the world, you know, because if, if it wasn't for us, the world would have ended or, or they say, actually, um, it's on this other day, you know, they, they, you know they, they, so, so they, they, yeah, so, so there's lots of research. There's a book coming out just a week after mine called The Power, Power of Us, which is, uh, has similar um, subject matter. And, and that's got a very good section on, on, on how these doomsday cults, they, they don't, they don't, you know, let go of their beliefs. They just update them in a way that protects their identity. Yeah. So, and I think that is the example that, that you gave is exactly right with, with the cult. That's, that's what they did. And, you know, they, they said, oh, well, he, 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 the cult was led by this man and woman who called themselves T and Doe. And they were supposed to be both leading them onto the UFOs personally to go to the next level above human. And, um, 
and um, one of them died of cancer, which kind of, which kind of went, you know. Um, so, so they, yeah, so they updated their belief in such a way that actually you, you could you, you could graduate dead. So let's just kill ourselves and we'll graduate. And they went, yeah, that's a great idea. And so that's what they did. They all they all um, they all did that. Mm. And, and the, the other thing I thought was fascinating about that was that you know you laugh at, um, quite naturally at the human individual metamorphosis and this idea that they're going to be on the next level above human. But when you look at the um, again the communists and the Nazis, the two big destructive movements of the 20th century, they had similar beliefs. You know, the Third Reich. Uh, you know, the, the the Nazis really believed that the Aryans were this super, you know, almost post-human race of um you know humans um and, and the, the third right was going to elevate them to even new heights and, and that's exactly what um the, the communists um promised would, would be the result of world communism was that was that was that you know the, the, the general level of human would would rise to the heights and we basically everybody would be a genius and mm. um you know so, so so this is very common in, in in these in these status games which become very destructive is is, is, is that they under is that they work by promising like impossible levels of status, and that's the kind of a drug that that that, that 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 pulls people in. Yeah, it's a drug that keeps people going, keeps people motivated within the game. It's like a a carrot in that sense because it keeps them within the system. You know, if if they if they fail mm. to deliver on that promise, then you lose people, don't you? Yeah, you have you have to you have to provide that status, and 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 you know, and that's what um that's what the Nazis did. Um, you know, and, and again, the communists, what I thought was very interesting was that, uh, was that after, um, after Stalin kind of went to war against the, you know, what he called the bourgeoisie, the intellectuals, and, 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 and you know, they, they were either killed or imprisoned or in, in the gulag or um, the very least driven out of their jobs. It created millions of vacancies and all these kind of sort of slightly mediocre people <laughs> ended up getting these great jobs. <laughs> and suddenly, so, 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 so what he created was this, was this incredibly loyal generation of people who had been given university positions and you know positions in industry and the arts, which they didn't really deserve on the level of their competence, and 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 so that's a massive um, uh, motivating force to get you to believe in the communist idea because it's like wow, this comedy, you know, like you know, it's, I'm, I'm a professor now, you know, I've only read four books, you know, <laughs> so, 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 so yeah, you 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 know, that's a, that's a really good way of uh, of getting people to sign on if. If it genuinely, if they genuinely get status out of this um, game that, that you're playing, mm. um, then um, then then you know they're, they're going to adopt your beliefs. I mean, I, I, one of my interests is in I didn't write about it, never written about it before, but the Stasi I always found very interesting, and the Stasi in East Germany is another great example of that. Where um, there's a really amazing book called Stasi Land by Anna Fundo. She, she went around meeting people that used to be in the Stasi. And so many of them, you know, really regretted the fall of the Berlin Wall and were, 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 were kind of convinced that communism was going to come back and this was only a temporary thing. And they were still, you know, they were still completely had bought that dream mm. because the Stasi had offered them genuine status over other people and, and they didn't have it anymore. So they were in this kind of state of mourning, even though in all rational senses you could see that Germany got so much better since the, since unification since the end of communism you know it's, it's, it's leading it leads Europe again um, but, but but they still they still want the old days back because that's when they had their status yeah the same for me was when I when I visited Iraq a couple of times a lot of the individuals there wanted Saddam Hussein back because when Saddam Hussein was there they had status wow. they gave them power they they gave he gave money to certain types of people. They wanted that status back. They wanted the, the, the feeling of having him back. They wanted that level of solidity in the, in the system. They wanted to have the money that they gave them specific. Obviously, it's not everyone, obviously. But there were certain types of people that need that level of yeah. that access. And, and they feel bad. They don't care about the consequences for the individual. They obviously just care about their personal circumstances. But it is interesting how status plays such a away with the mind that you can forget about the crimes that an individual has committed just because of your own personal status in relation to other people yeah that's fascinating to hear you say that yeah i mean it's completely consistent and and you can see how easily the the adoption of the kind of irrational beliefs comes very closely to that because it's like well life was better when Saddam was here and then actually you know he wasn't all bad because at least we had order then at least the black fucking Americans weren't here telling us what exactly. to do and, and then you know and then you, you, and it's just this it's very easy to see how you, you end up being a 
a defender of Saddam because you know the as I've written in previous books, the brain is this kind of hero maker. It's you know if if we've got a healthy brain, it's preoccupied with wanting to make us feel heroic. And if we you know and if you want Saddam back, but you're a good person, which is what people who aren't psychopaths think they are then it means that you're going to have to find a way of, of believing that Saddam actually wasn't that bad, actually, if you think about it. You know, it's like in The Heretics when I, when I met these neo-Nazis who, were, who ended up being Holocaust, who were Holocaust deniers, and so many of them um, I found had parents who, who'd served as you know, senior Nazis in the Second World War. And they were, they were, they were wrestling with this belief that they, you know, they, they loved their mums and dads. But, the, but, you know, Nazis are now synonym for evil, so, so what does that mean? Well, it must mean, well, I know I'm, my dad was an amazing guy, so it must mean that all oh, this is bullshit about the Holocaust. And that, you know, that's where they ended up getting to after a lifetime of, 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 of rationalisation. You know, they, they didn't want to feel less, less about themselves. They certainly didn't want to feel less about their parents. They, they wanted to feel proud of their parents. So they have to find a story to tell that, 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 that supports that sense of pride. Yeah, I find that absolutely fascinating because the the cognitive dissonance there is very interesting for me because it's the idea that you believe that someone's inherently evil and you don't support them, but someone in your lineage or someone that you know supports them and you have an emotional attachment to them. And thus you create a story which protects them, which then basically makes you go down the road of re re rewriting history in a way that say oh well actually what they did was a good thing or perhaps even go to the extent that it didn't happen which is a whole other way of looking at history yeah, saying I mean, just yeah, denying it in, yeah. in 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 general yeah 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 as you say they're literally rewriting history you know that that's what they're doing and, and then and they latch on to people like david irving who who has this kind of you know this kind of veneer of being some kind of a scholar because he used to be a, a highly regarded historian so that's why they latch onto him because he's telling us just like the um the, the you know the just jussie smollett and the and, and the, the 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 woman who claimed to have been gang raped in esquire magazine um or i think it was rolling stone magazine actually i always get that wrong it's rolling stone magazine um you you know, you 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 latch on to people who tell stories that make you feel better about your yeah your your, your yourself and your beliefs and your group. So where do we where do we go here if we're playing the status game? Do we do we exit the game? Do we subjugate ourselves to the rule of the game, or is there any space to mediate and and create our own? Do we have to? Um, how do we manage the the status game as as individuals in this? Uh, neo neoliberal time. I know you gave a, a chapter to neoliberalism in the book, and I know you've done you did the same in uh, in selfie as well. Um, it's a very interesting concept about how neoliberal self and, and status and status place. So, where where what do you want the individual reading this to, to take away, and, and how they navigate the, the the status game? I suppose there's two big takeaways for me. The, the first one is to is to you know this idea of, of of making sure that you're playing a hierarchy of games. Because you don't want to play just one game, because then you're in a cult. You know, <laughs> you don't want to be in a cult because you know if, you, if if all of your status and connection depends on one game, it means that, you, that you're going to be massively incentivized to um, do everything they tell you to and chop your balls off. They tell you. Um, so, 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 but but you don't, also don't want to play play loads of games equally because in order because what you want is status. You want you want to feel uh, you know if you if you feel that like your life has meaning, you want to feel. That you're of value to people, that people actually look to you and go, "Wow, you're this, you're pretty good," you know. Whether that's a virtue thing or a competence thing, and and, and that takes effort, you know, that takes a bit of effort. So, so, so what you want to do is play a hierarchy of games where you've got, you know, one or two games that are really important to you and that you, you get, you know, relatively good amount of status out of, and you put time and effort into, and then a hierarchy of games kind of beneath that. So you've got this kind of kind of shored up. Um, kind of array of different games basically don't be like me and be a writer and nothing else because then you're really screwed <laughs> that's the that's the first one and and the second one i think is just to be care just to be care of your your moral self because morality is a game and and you know it's a really seductive game because it's it's the it's a game that tells us that we are high we are high status you know it, it's believed that the strongest bias you know we have in our you know irrational kind of belief we have in our brain is of our own moral status we like to you know we're very good at um fooling ourselves about how how, how morally good we and, and the people who are playing a game with are compared to other people 
and, and I think that we can really run away with that, especially in the age of social media, where it's so easy to, to, to earn status by attacking rivals mm-hmm. um, and boasting about ourselves. So I just think it's about being careful about morality. And, 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 and the way I kind of write about it in the book is to kind of reduce your moral sphere, you know, like how how much are you spending your time in your head or with other people morally judging other people versus how much are you thinking about yourself and am I doing it you know am I being the best me morally and it's just about working working that ratio I think so 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 you're doing so you're thinking more about your own moral worth and less about that of other people because it's so easy today especially on the internet to get some cheap status by attacking people or then putting people down um, to, to kind of have that kind of conscious sense of when you're doing that and trying to do that less. Yeah, I think the difficulty is when it becomes habitual, as we as you discussed many times in the book. And I think as many people can attest to when they when they go down these roads is once it becomes habitual and you use that as a way of you just spend all your time on it. You know, you just yeah. have to stop yourself get to, to, to get to that to get to that place. Yeah, and it becomes addictive. It, it becomes addictive because you know it's so. Um, you know, in the in the book, I describe social media as a slot machine for status. You know, it's this idea that every time you're on, you do anything on social media, make any post, or even a, even if you like something, or you know, it's a you're, you're you're spinning that wheel, and you're not sure what status you're going to get back. You might get massive status, loads of retweets and likes. You might get attacked. You might go down. So it's this addictive game yeah. that we're playing, and, and, and it's all about status. Whether whether you're, you know, whether you're showing off about your humble bragging about your holiday, or you're attacking somebody, you were, you, whether you're kind of Lawrence Fox or Jamila Jamila attacking people for their moral beliefs, um, it, it, it's all it's all a status yeah. game, you know, and and it can easily become addictive. It's in the same way that junk food is addictive, you know, we, we've evolved to feel rewarded for seeking out sweet food because sweet food used to be really really rare and you have to go to great effort to find it and you know status used to you know we we, 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 we've evolved to seek status but not in an environment where status is so easy to find as it is on social media and and social media has created this kind of game that's so easy to hack in order to get easy status and so, so so it's to treat social media like you treat mars bars you know it, it, it's fun but understand it understand that it's addictive and it's not good for you in 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 in, in you know certain quantities i've never heard someone liken social media to mars bars so you're the first for that one will so i appreciate that <laughs> definitely thank you uh, thank you again will for taking the time uh, to discuss your book uh, the status game on social position and how we use it i've got obviously the, the pre published version but yeah the, the cover's different i'm assuming um yeah when is it out again september the 2nd september the 2nd in in bookstores and online uh, yep. where's the best place that individual can find you will to to stay in contact obviously um, um probably twitter social media uh, as ha- well although yeah having just slagged off uh, <laughs> social media um twitter is at yeah. w s t o r r yes so that, that's the best place to because i'll just that's for updates and whatnot yeah perfect thank you will Cool. Cheers, Anne. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more content. Also, visit our website www.booktalktoday.com to subscribe and download the latest edition of our magazine. Join our mailing list to receive the first issue for free to get a taste for the value-packed content that we are offering. Book Talk Today. For readers, by readers.